Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another episode of the Ahmed Khan podcast. Today we are joined by Ottoman historian Dr. Yaqub Ahmed to discuss the rise and fall of civilizations. A science which I think is very pertinent in today's age to study to see why certain societies rise and what are the reasons that they fall. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Yaqub, once again. No problem. Um, our last discussion, if you haven't seen, is on the importance of studying history. Um, it's actually the second podcast that we've done. So uh, I, I would highly recommend you to go and watch that as well um, to see why topics like these are so important. Um, so just getting straight into it, Dr. Yaku, we have this science of the rise and fall of civilizations. It's a topic which isn't really studied as much anymore, um, but it's a topic which explains why countries like america are on the rise and why maybe looking at a country like america we can see certain tendencies that cause for it to fall but my opening uh, my intro my opening question to you is is can you give like a brief explanation behind this science how does it work and are there like certain anomalies to it uh, uh bismillah so um actually the question needs to be unpacked a little bit um simply because we started off with the notion of the rise and fall of civilizations, right? And then we went on to the notion of the possibility of the rise and fall of America as a state, as a country, as an empire, depending on how you want to look at it. In terms of civilizational discourse, this is interesting because when we look at Islam in particular, and this is something I'm sure we'll talk about later on today, the idea is, is uh, has Islam as a civilization in regards to civilizational discourse gone through a particular decadent or decline period? The argument to that would be no. The argument is, is that Islam is still very vibrant. It's still here today. M more and more people are still converting to Islam, even though there isn't a particular political entity in the past that had some level of agency in regards to the spread of Islam. We can see even in the, the fields of Islamic studies, which is still a very Western-centric uh, um, mode of learning, but you can see that Islamic studies, if we can call it that, in um, in comparison to the study of any other religion in Western academia, is still probably, in my personal opinion, but I think there's enough evidence to back this, is the probably the most vibrant um, field of studies regarding religions, quote unquote religions, than any mm -hmm. other field in that sense. And it's probably the largest department in regards to the study of religions than any other religion in Western academia, indicating that Islam, even today has a particular place in the world which is unparalleled in regards to religions or civilizational discourse right so the question about rise and fall of civilizations is interesting then when we're talking about america what we're implying i guess or the assumption is is the the rise and fall of america as a reflection of western civilization and that in itself is a question that needs to be unpacked in terms of what we mean by that um, for us as Muslims, um, right now, I would argue that for Muslims in particular, the, the learning of civilizational discourse has become um, more and more popular because Muslims are trying to understand their place in the world as they see themselves. Mm -hmm. And there is a increased popularity of the study of Ibn Khaldun, more specifically amongst Muslims and in Western academia now more, to, more than in, at any other time in, in, in our modern history. And so for us, it starts to matter in regards to this idea of civilizational theory. What's interesting is if you look at early Islamic works, we don't have this framework of looking at civilizational theory in the same way. Even if you look at the works of Ibn Khaldun, he's not necessarily talking about civilizations. He's actually talking about states mm -hmm. and dynasties. Okay. But then we can extend his idea out and make more sense to it in terms of how could we apply it today. Civilizational theory in reality is something that emerges in the 19th century after colonialism, and it's the, the West European powers or Western European powers in particular that are colonizing nations, civilizing nations, and then creating a sort of paradigm of the dominance of their civilization over everyone else's civilization. Mm -hmm. As a response to that, there, there was a, a Muslim response in the 19th century, both in India and in the Ottoman world, um, uh, as a way of responding to this insistence of showing the west or the western europeans in particular as being a greater civilization hence their sort of like um 
political rise and agency over everyone else in the world. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at Muslim societies, and if you look at maybe China, um, and you looked at um, parts of Africa, there were works and discourses at the time that were refuting this dominance of Western European civilization over their own civilization. And so this is one of the things that, that you see which happens in the 19th century. Anyway, the collapse of many of these, um, what you could call imperial powers and the formation of nation states and then the dominance of Western academia in particular meant that in Western academia, this rise and fall narrative and this creation of this idea of Western progress and as a result, placing people within these civilizational blocks uh -huh, becomes okay. more prevalent, which is that it becomes a mode of comparison in comparison to Western civilization. And as a result of that, Muslims also bought into this paradigm. And so for Muslims, there was an idea that during the Andalusian period, we would scientifically develop in ABCD, and we are no longer doing that. Or in um, the Abbasid period, we were doing ABCD scientifically and intellectually, and we are no longer doing that. But this, the problem with that to some degree, and the problem with civilizational discourse and narrative, it's, just, it's, a, dip, it's a dependence on a narrative, is that at times it misses um, specific details. Um, we could, like, it's, it's like this big history, right? And yeah. Muslims have a, have a tendency of writing big history. And there's an importance of writing what we'd call like this grand narrative history, which is that you can see from a meta perspective and a, a, and a longer period perspective, you can see the, the peaks and troughs of a particular given community in a society. Exactly. Yeah. But when you go into more macro history or when you go deeper into detail, it's harder to discern that. Now, for, for you and I today, for example, um, when you're living your everyday life, it becomes very difficult to make sense of civilizational theory in terms of how do you place yourself? Are we on the up or are we on the down? Yeah. Because when you live the day to day, it's very macro. Mm -hmm. But what we are trying to do, I guess, and even in this podcast, is take a step back and then go, OK, from a particular moment in time in history, what's going on? Are we on our way up or are we on our way down? And we can make sense of that with the United States of America. So if we were to compare the USA prior to the Cold War, you'd see it's all, people would argue that the USA is on its way, a particular rise of the United States as a superpower. The collapse of the Soviet Union means that they become the, the sole superpower in the world. And then people will argue that since then, with there being no rival, there's been a particular decline at the Americans as a particular superpower. And then people make the argument of the rise of China and so forth, right? This is the debate that's being put out there. The mm -hmm. question is, is, is that type of analysis reflective? And then there's the other aspect of civilizational theory, which is what's happening on a societal level, the issues of morality, the issues of the absence of morality. It, it, does the absence of morality, can it lead to a decline in particular civilizations and so forth and, and whatnot? But um, these are interesting questions, which I think we should um, really, on the one hand, um, really take into account, but on the other hand, try to find ways of problematizing too. Yeah. <clears throat> so Dr. Yaku, for example, you know, you have someone like Malik Benabi, um, mm. who in his theory, he talked, he, his theory was, um, was very, um, I think it was, I think it's quite traditional in the sense that he believed that there was a rise. And then once there was a peak, there was, a, there was a fall, Right. but can but after the fall, can there be another rise as well? So in the case, like one of the arguments we put forward in regards to Ottoman studies, and this is what many Ottoman historians make, is they, they talk about a rise, fall, rise, fall, rise, fall in regards to the Ottoman period, or less so in terms of rise, fall, but an issue of backwards and forwards. And and maybe looking at, um, so let's look at Khaldun for a second. Ibn Khaldun was alive when the Ottomans were, were around, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that context. So one of the things that you see is that Khaldunian theory is developed in specifically in relation to um the uh um north african states yeah but he's around when the ottomans are being blitzed by timolik uh in that context he, he's he's aware of what's happening there but what's interesting is that the ottomans clearly then go on for another 400 years 500 years regarding uh, you know khaldunian discourse yeah so and the ottomans in various moments in their history are reading ibn khaldun's theory 
um, as a way of um, seeing whether the Khaldunian narrative, which is cyclical, and this idea of becoming sedentary, whether it's um, actually reflective of their own experience. In essence, it isn't in some ways, because the Ottomans outlive Khaldunian theory in some sense, unless if we're looking at the idea of the Ottomans that go through particular interregnum points and take particular breakages, that they reflect that. But they are an anomaly in that sense, 600 years, they say. Uh -huh. So the question is, is that um, do we have peaks and troughs in the Ottoman period? And, and a lot of historians are making the argument that there are peaks and trough moments. There's no denying that probably the 17th, 18th century, the Ottoman experience is going through a particular um, moment where the European, Western European states have have um, have moved in a direction where the Ottomans cannot compete. But what's intriguing is in that period, you're seeing the rise of Spain and Portugal, right? Yeah. But then afterwards, we see the collapse of Spain and Portugal as a as a powerful dynastic entity in that sense, and then they're replaced by Russia, France, and 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 Britain, and then that shifts where you have the introduction of Germany or Prussia at the time. But the Ottomans are still consistently there during those moments. And it's because we say that in Ottoman history in particular, that the, the Ottomans have the capacity of state reinvention. And so Baki okay. Tezjan, for example, he calls it in the 17th, early 17th century, he calls it the second empire, which is when the Ottomans move away from um, the culture of fratricide into the culture of regicide. And what that meant was that now the Janissaries had become a dominant force. And as a result of Janissary dominance, the state itself becomes a different type of state and it shifts and it changes and it evolves and it's going through a particular peak moment. And in the 19th century, when the Janissaries are abolished, we can argue that this is the state going through a third empire phase where this is a new modern dynastic imperial state, which is in, to some degree in the 19th century on its way up again. Unfortunately for it, World War I happens and that doesn't allow them mm. to see a fru fruition of these things. But intellectually, for example, we see the development of Arabic in a way that that is quite interesting, the, what we call the Nahda period. Uh, we see um, the same thing regarding Ottoman Turkish. We, all, we also see that regarding, um, what do you call it, Armenian and other languages in the Ottoman domains. So it's sort of like Renaissance period in Ottoman culture, in Ottoman statecraft and so forth. And the Ottomans are very quickly closing the gap in comparison to their Western European counterparts in the 19th century. So what we learn from Ottoman studies then mm. is there is a possibility of the state having the capacity or the machinery um, having the capacity to continuously reinvent itself whenever new elites new generations, new thinkers, and new more modes of technology come into the fray. Um, this is what's interesting. And you, we could argue the same with the United States of America right now, that even though it's going for a flux moment, the assumption that it's going down is, is a, is a it's, it's probably a mistake to make that assumption. And the better assumption would be oh, to say okay. that America as a superpower is increasing, interestingly robust. And um, it's still in an infancy stage in many ways, you could argue as an empire in that sense. So yeah, the, the peaks and troughs argument, I think is a better one than, than the argument of rise and fall or the cyclical argument of Khaldun. And they mm. were for specific moments and specific times. Mm. And, and that's, that's quite fascinating, Dr. Yaku, because I was stuck in this bubble thinking mm. solely of there's a rise and then there's a peak right after. But it's yeah. interesting that you mentioned this idea of like reinvention of the yeah. empire starts to decline, but because these new elites come in, the new generation comes, they're able to think creatively, like yeah. Toynbee talked about the creative minority, yeah. that the minority of people who start thinking creatively, who start right. developing these new inventions, and then instead of it going all the way down, it just goes back up. Totally. I mean, one of the things that, that's my cat. You just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that you, you'll notice um, is that um, that's why I, I, I posited the question in the beginning, are you talking about a state? Are you talking about a civilization? In mm -hmm. regards to civilization, Islam is still here. In that context, so the argument I'm making then is that even though um, we have gone through a particular flux moment in the nation state period in the region since the collapse of the Ottomans, nonetheless, you can still see that there is a particular what you could call um, regeneration that's taking place within the within the Muslim mindset. And these when one of the important things is when we're doing meta histories, we forget sometimes time scales. 
So we seem to assume we'll go, you know, we'll go Fatih, Bayezid, Selim, Suleiman, boom, 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 boom. And we think these are like happening over one, two years, but actually this is a hundred year span. Yeah. Right. So in this sense, if you look at it um, in that context, what you could say is that generationally, um, you could one could argue that um, there is some for, form of um, renaissance taking place within the Muslim mindset um, in the sense that, okay, people could critique the Muslim communities and societies and saying they've gone to a particular form of decadence which hasn't um, been reflective before, but at the same time, the particular form of questions that Muslims are asking, the particular form of intellectualization that's taking place, the particular form of, of, of the sort of like desire of challenging some of the failures that have happened in the last 30, 40, 50 years is still quite intriguing in the Muslim mindset. The fact that okay. Islam is still here is an indication that on a civilizational basis that Islam, for example, or Muslims in particular have gone through these up, down, peaks and troughs moments. Hmm. Um, I always give football as an example, you know, like I support Liverpool Football Club. And one of the things that I remember is when I was a kid, they were the best team. Um, in, in the 70s, for example, I was being told by my father that they were the best team. And then in the eight, then they went through a particular difficult moment. Then in the 80s, when I supported them, they were the best team. Then in the 90s, up until, you know, <laughs> quite recently, they were still in these doldrums. And now they're back up to the top. We're looking at the case with Barcelona going through a difficult moment. But these super clubs that have these super infrastructures, they find ways of regenerating themselves so long as the institutions are in place. The Ottomans, to some degree, were like that, and that's why they had the capacity to survive so long. World War One, though, there was a particular way of deconstructing those institutions. Hmm. But Islam, still, if we're going to look at civilizational discourse purely from the perspective of ideas, culture, traditions, and so forth, then we're still here in that sense. So we are going through an interesting moment. But if we're looking at purely from the perspective of states, then I can understand that not every state or not every entity is going to be around forever. It's Qadr Allah and everything has a finite ending to it. And the nation state will have an ending to it as well. And so will the world that we mm -hmm. live in right now. So, so Dr. Yaqub, I have an interesting question for you. Because you talked okay. about how the, the, the Islamic civilization now is in a, is in a decline. Many argue that after World War I and with the partition of Africa, the Islamic civilization collapsed. Mm -hmm. that it died um is this do you think that do you think the terminology there is correct in that it collapsed it died or that it merely just severely declined with the destruction of the caliphate i i don't know i i wouldn't put, i wouldn't like using the word that the islamic civilization collapsed i think the ottomans collapsed for sure i think particular forms of muslim governance collapsed um and they went through moments of of confusion um as a result of that uh, I would be reluctant to say that if we were to look at Muslims today, that they're in a in a period of decline. I think we have we are very selective in the way that we um, we examine the Ummah. I think one of the interesting things I've always said to my fellow um, Muslim friends and colleagues and brothers, in particular who are affiliated with particular forms of revivalist movements, which is that what yardstick are they using in that 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 is that can be explained to me in the way that they are examining this ummah in terms of where the ummah are at, right? Um, and I would like to see a, a thorough examination of them showing me that to make a judgment on this current ummah at the moment is either being um, declined or going through a positive moment is how, how are we making those assessments? And often the assessments are made um, heavy handedly in the sense that um, the negative experiences we go through and the concerns that we have in terms of some of the negative impacts regarding the Muslim community, we seem to assume that that is the dominant discourse and narrative. Well, that is that is what is dominating the Ummah. So people say social media is killing the Ummah. Um, more and more Muslims are, are, are leaving the faith, more and more, and so forth. The narratives go on, right? But then when you look at the, the numbers, you can see that more and more people are turning to Islam. People are still converting to Islam in Western societies where apparently they had enlightenment and they were supposed to be a better civilization than us. Muslims are still keeping hold onto their faith in these societies, although there are particular flux moments in various different nations and so forth. Um, we are very dependent on the Anglosphere um, West when we look at the West in particular, but Muslims in France, Germany, um, Muslims in other parts of um, the Western world are still very diverse and eclectic. 
We then um, don't examine Muslims in Africa at all. We seem to assume that Islam doesn't exist in Africa, and yet in Africa yeah. there's, there, there are so many Muslims who are maintaining the tradition, practices of the tradition, um, um, and still um, um, upholding the faith of Islam, the Asian subcontinent, China, and so forth. So in that sense, um, a more thorough assessment would tell us um, if we were to step back away from social media activity, which is some, it's the lazy and sloppy yardstick we're using as a way of judging Muslims, hmm. that um, a lot of Muslims are still finding ways um, and interesting ways of holding on to Islam. And I would argue that how do we judge progress? And um, we're seeing that more and more people are still taking an interest in Islam in that context, and Islam is still here. Um, and in that sense, we may not be as declined as people think we are. In that mm -hmm, sense. Okay. What we are lacking, and this is true to say that, because when we look at the United States of America, and then we make a comparison right now regarding the rise of China, is a state apparatus that has the capacity to represent Islam's interest in a way that's comparable to the US or China or to, the, or to Russia or any European state. And that, that is a, a, a truism that we cannot deny. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, but still within those frameworks, science for example muslims are not falling behind in science the, the majority of the doctors in, in medicine are um, there are a lot of muslim doctors in medicine there are a lot of muslims in tech there are a lot of muslims in very high positions of industry there are a lot of muslims still in western academia there are some great muslim academics the ulama are still here they still exist so there's still a lot that we can work with in regards to the muslim community that we shouldn't be so um um you know um, nervous about the, the critique culture towards the, the Ummah by and large is nothing new. Muslim scholars have been critiquing the Ummah since the beginning of time. They continuously critique the Ummah as not being to the standard that they expect the Ummah to be at a standard mm -hmm. at. And I don't think that's ever going to change. And that critique culture, it doesn't mean it's a reflection of a reality. That's the right of educated people to critique the society, to try to have a better expectation from them. But within those negative moments um, and those moments of critique that are rightly so there, there are, I think, also things that we should be and ought to be positive about. Hmm. You know, there's a number of excellent points you brought up and it reminds me of the saying of French, uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, who last year said that Islam is in a crisis. Yeah. Um, and often, you know, we think like, at least for myself, we think that the, you know, the, the Muslim world is in a decline, you know, mm -hmm. it's, 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 you know, <clears throat> it's in a horrible state, but hearing what you said, we have to place some asterisks on that statement, because yeah. if you're looking at Muslims in the West, particularly in America, you yeah. know, Muslim comprise, um, a large, <clears throat> a large number of doctors, a large yeah. number of the scientists of academics, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. They're one of the most successful minorities. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned within the book, um, The Triple Package, which is a book written yeah. by Harvard professors. They state that one of the most successful communities in America yeah. is the Pakistani community, uh, amongst yeah. others. So even when we say that the Muslim world is in decline, what we really mean from what you're saying is the Muslim states reaching the same level as a state yeah. like America or like a China. Yeah. And you know what's interesting about that is that the argument that I would posit is Muslims have the capacity to create political and intellectual structures that can compete with the Western powers and China, but there is a particular form of violence which is aimed towards them, which forces them to abandon their countries of origin and then give their agency to the West. What that indicates is that Muslims in of themselves have the talent, the ability, and the capacity to do interesting things. Unfortunately, they face a lot of repression from whatever structures that exist in the Muslim world, because that's the status quo at the moment, and they are unable to maximize their talent and ability. What that indicates then is there's still something there um, within uh, Muslims in that sense. And even in, in, in regards to uh, Muslims in the West, um, Muslims in the West have the capacity to use the, the tools of power, and so they can make a lot of noise in that sense, and that can feel like a reflection of the Ummah as a whole. But if you come down to the ground, um, and in many Muslim societies around the Muslim world, you will see that um, Islam is still very vibrant. It still, um, you know, it still exists. And there's a lot of people that, that believe in the notion of salvation, that believe in the notion of family, that believe in the ideas of piety, 
um, and, and believe in the issues of generosity and, and so forth. And so these things are still here. Look at the numbers of people that still go on the Hajj. Look at Ramadan when, when the sort of practices that people, Muslims are still executing in Ramadan. And there, there isn't an abandonment in Ramadan in that sense. So there's a lot of things. And the Salah is still being, being done as a staple. So th there is still something there that we can work with. Um, you know, the fact that Muslims are to some degree, and including this podcast, we are capable of self-criticism in regards mm. to the state of the Ummah. Um, I think in of itself is is unique because I don't see other civilizational peoples or religious groups that exercise this level of criticism and robustness and plurality as the Muslim community is still act, um, exercising. And the last point I want to make is, it's very clear in Islam that we are not um, we are not to be judged based on how many Muslims there are. It's not a number game for us. It's mm -hmm. quality over quantity. I mean, mm -hmm. look, Allah Ta'ala doesn't need any of us. So in the end of the day, like even if there's um, one Muslim in the world, that, that's sufficient for Allah. Like So Islam is not judged on the basis of um, how many Muslims exist, which is a... a, a a trap that many Muslims fall into in the in the assumption that um, you know that the, the number of people that are converting to Islam or the number of Muslims that are leaving Islam this is somehow a a reflection on Islam itself. It's not. It's a particular reflection of politi particular political and economic and social um, sort of like um, fluxes that are taking place in the world right now, of, of which human beings have always been um, impacted by. Um, in that sense. For us, I always tell Muslims, there is no fear. They should have, feel no fear to, to defend Islam. Islam doesn't need defending. Mm -hmm. um, Allah Ta'ala will protect his deen. Islam came for your salvation. You need it to, to, for your salvation. You don't need to defend it. In that sense, you don't need to worry if people are leaving. In that sense, we will figure it out. The deen is still quite robust. And um, you know, it, was, it will align itself at any particular time, just like it's done in the past in, in that sense. And Muslims haven't only um, faced um, a, a crisis in regards to the sort of like bombardment they're getting from popular culture, social media, and hegemonic, you know, secular politics. There's, there's, Muslims have gone through wars. Muslims have gone through famine. Muslims have gone through um, authoritarianism and, and, and so many barbaric forms of, of governance. All of these things put into the mix. The fact that we are still here and we are still talking of Islam and there are many Muslims who recognize that and still adhere to Islam, tells you something about the, the strength of Islam rather than its weakness in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, and I think I think the main lesson, the, the, the take-home point really is that um, sure, the Muslim world might be going through some problems, but for like people like me and you, Muslims that are living in the West, um, we can stand on equal, if not a higher footing than our contemporaries, um, yeah. whether that's economic, <clears throat> whether that's social, whether that's intellectual yeah. um, but we can challenge them in that way and we can kind of be the spark um, yeah, but I want to ask you something that. interesting Dr. Yaku can I, can I just add to that this before, question... before we go on to your question can yeah, I go ahead. Go ahead. sorry yeah, go ahead. for interrupting you Ahmed because this is a really interesting point one of the things I've noticed as an academic and I, and I, I look forward to, to when you go into academia as a full-fledged academic is that Muslims Muslim academics now are challenging the sort of like gatekeepers that were doing Islamic studies in the past, right? And, and the gatekeepers are getting nervous. I can tell you this from my own experience. They're getting very nervous that Muslim academics in of themselves are saying, that's not what Islam is. We're not going to go down that road. We're not going to allow you to tell us what Islam is. We're not going to go down the direction of Orientalism. And yes, you've rejected Orientalism because of Edward Said, but we still know there's a practice of 2.0 Orientalism and so forth. We Muslims are here. We are the authority and we are going to speak of Islam and we're going to find a way of, of now challenging all those departments and institutions in the way that they speak of Islam as being representatives of Islam. And I'm seeing this more and more now in Western academia that Muslims are speaking of Islam in the Islamic studies departments in a way that had never happened before. And I think that's an indication of, of something taking place, which is interesting. It, it, it's an interesting observation, you know, um... Sayyid Hussein Nasser once said um, that uh, 
he wishes that you know one day the day will come where all of the heads of the Islamic studies departments will be run by Muslims, mm -hmm. just like the heads of the Jewish studies are now run by Jewish people. Yes. And so I think that's the shift that we're kind of going towards. And I think institutions kind of like Zaytuna College, mm -hmm. like a Cambridge Muslim College, really their goal is to kind of take over academia, um, which is an excellent slide. Yeah. To my next question, which is um, I'm trying to understand what is the relationship between the academic and the government, you know, the head of the administration. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we talked about Ibn Khaldun. Right. Ibn Khaldun was taught to the statesmen, to the scholars, the thinkers and historians of the Ottoman Empire. There's a video where U.S. President Ronald Reagan is being interviewed and he says that he learned economics from Ibn Khaldun, um, which is very interesting. And um, Arnold Toynbee is somebody who's really read by the West, one of their great historians. Um, so these are people, so my, my question being Dr. Yakub, is, um, what is the relationship between the academic and between the administration, especially on a topic such as, you know, the rise and fall of societies, of civilizations, are they consulting one another? Are they reminding them of these principles of history? You know, and it's what's interesting is academics in some ways are no different than the ulama, you know, in many ways, just like in Islam, um, the ulama who's, who are practitioners of ulum al -Din, would throughout Islamic history um, be a sort of like mediator between state and society and try to influence governance in some shape or form to adhere to the principles of Islam. Um, there were some ulama who were apolitical, but even that was a political position. There were um, other ulama who were directly involved in the politics and the other ulama who were influenced in politics just by being influential thinkers. And you know, what comes to my mind and I find very interesting is, you know, Albert Harani, and we, we all have read the works of Albert Harani, who would um, be very influential in the, stu in the studies of Arab studies, Middle Eastern studies, and Ottoman studies in that context. Now, Albert Harani was part of a committee that spoke to um, the American presidency at the time when there was an attempt to create the state of Israel. And Albert Harani was speaking on behalf of the Palestinians as an academic, in his capacity as an academic, to highlight the atrocities that the Zionist movements and colonizers were enacting against the Palestinians in the, during the, the, the years of the 1940s in particular, um, as a way of making the case to power of the possibilities of trying to understand what's happening in the region. Here you can see directly there's an academic who has some level of agency to try to speak to power. Unfortunately for Albert Harani, he wasn't successful because the Americans were not interested in listening to Albert Harani at the time. Mm -hmm. But the Americans, who the Americans did listen to throughout the years, and even the Bush administration in the, the second Bush administration listened to, was Bernard Lewis. Bernard Lewis as an academic was very influential on some of the policies that the Bush mm -hmm. administration executed in the in the Middle East or the you know um, uh, Western Asia, depending on what you want to call it. Um, in that period. And in that sense, you can see that there is a level of influence that academics can have. And I think in Muslim societies, what, are, what I would posit to Muslim governments is to listen to their Muslim expertise more. I think Muslim academics now have become a lot better in the field of political science, sociology, humanities, and along with the ulama in regards to the issues, matters to do with faith and so forth, I think there's a lot of expertise that can be posited to governments, including economics, in a way that can make those states stronger, that can fashion a different reality and can fashion an alternative because the Muslims have skills to do that. What I noticed regarding Muslim political movements in particular is maybe they were missing some, some of this expertise because they had a... A, a, a particular expectation of the experts within their own midst. But if they had broadened their umbrella a little bit and listened to other Muslims who had expertise in particular fields, I think it, it would they would have been beneficial to them also. Now they might argue that they did that and I'm you know, simplifying this. And, and if I'm doing that, that, apologies. But the point I'm trying to make more so is I think that there are so many Muslim experts now, especially in the field, various fields of academia, that Muslims have a lot to offer in regards to these various fields, which can be very, very beneficial for um, political states and governments. And I think in some countries, Muslim academics 
um, are providing better advice to certain countries than in others. I mean, mm. we see this in the case of Turkey. There are academics within the, the Turkish um, um, sort of like governmental structure that advise the, the presidency here. Um, so it is interesting. As an Ottoman historian, though, um, who are who are some of the agencies, if you're able to disclose, some of the agencies or governments that are interested in wanting to hear what an Ottoman historian has to say and using that to change policies or curriculums? Yeah, at the moment, I haven't seen much of that, to be honest with you, in regards to Ottoman studies in and of itself. I mean, I think there is a renaissance taking place regarding the, the study of Ottoman studies. I think on an automatic level, I think more and more Muslims now have become interested in Ottoman studies. Alhamdulillah, that's a great thing. Um, I, I, I'm not saying simply to study Ottoman studies, by the way. I think um, when I speak to Muslims, they have a very rudimentary understanding of, you know, um, the Abbasids and the Umayyads in that context. Um, there is an absence in the understanding of the Seljuks or the Mamluks uh, or Baibur or Ayyubids and so forth, or even the Mughals and, you know, even the dynasties that exist in, like the, 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 in, in Sokoto, for example, or other parts of the Muslim world. There's, a, there's an absence in that. What we can learn is, and I, I think here I try to explain that history is not just simply about learning from failures and mistakes. History is about understanding the disposition of human beings and their successes and how they interacted with each other and intrigue and statecraft and how um, they were able to succeed in particular places. It is here that I think there's a lot of things that Muslims can take from that. In the region, well, the, the region that we're in at the moment, um, the imprint of Ottoman, the Ottomans is still here. It hasn't left. And so there's still a lot that can be learned. I, I've made the argument before in other podcasts um, that um, Marshall Hodgson made the argument that the, the venture into Islam for Islamic studies department was something that emerged in the 19th century when the European, Western European powers, their interest in Islam was basically an interest in India and an interest in the Ottomans, right? That was their main. And as mm -hmm. a result, by default, Islam became an interest for them, right? And so the interest um, of these two entities um, was important for them because they had political ambitions regarding the spreading of colonialism. Now, after World War I, um, the Ottomans collapsed, and then after World War II, India is lost. But the development of Ottoman studies and Islamic studies becomes a mainstay in Western academia as part of foreign policy initiatives. Ah, okay. And so Ottoman studies and Islamic studies are Western, ent is, is a, they're both a Western enterprise. What's intriguing is they were separated from each other as different departments. Uh, they were not uh, amalgamated as one. But these were um, well studied in the United States in particular before for creating um, practitioners of foreign policy. So people were experts in the region, understood the history of the region, understood Islam, were ready for it, became particular government agents or academics or whatnot. And, 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 and so, you know, that's how they continued. And we lack that in the Muslim world because in the Muslim world, the collapse of the Ottomans really we're not going to create an Ottoman studies department. We didn't look at the study of the fall of the Ottomans in this way. Um, most institutions had their modest state institutions and continued with that. And then the, the nation states would facilitate an alternative learning of history, which was to promote the nation state narrative. And so the Ottomans had lost out in that sense. Um, and then Islamic studies, we didn't create Islamic studies departments, obviously, because we were teaching Ulum al -Din. So mm -hmm. now going back on that, the point I'm making, is that the West had done something interesting, which is that they have um, kept the vibrancy of Ottoman studies around. Um, that is something that we can tap into. And and, and there is still, if, if the West or Western universities, like the main big universities in the United States of America are still willing to fund Ottoman studies as um, a, in, a department that is worth studying, that tells you something in regards to agency. Let's look at Israel, the state of Israel. The, the, the works that the Israelis publish in regards to Ottoman studies is phenomenal in comparison to the fact that the state of Israel has no Ottoman past in that sense. The Zionism, it, you know, the Jews who were related to the Ottoman domains were never interested in the Zionist project. This is a European project, and yet they, yeah. they, 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 they write so many works on Ottoman history. Why? Because it gives them a sense of 
intellectual agency over Muslims in this context, in the region. Oh, okay. um, it gives them agency over the Palestinians. It gives them agency over the memory of the region regarding the Palestinians. The Palestinians are unable to go beyond uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, whereas the Israelis are able to construct narratives of the Ottoman past to some degree and then posit it to the Palestinians as a way of trying to otherize them, confuse them or whatnot. You know, so I'm not saying that every Israeli academic is doing that. I'm sure there are many Israeli academics out there who are quite robust. But as an institution, the fact that the Israelis, the Turks and the USA produce so many works on Ottoman studies tells you where Ottoman studies is at the moment and how these different states, um, what you can see, um, internalize Ottoman studies for, their, for themselves in the way that they see how Ottoman studies can um, be informative in the world that we live in or the region anyway in that sense and, and it's quite fascinating that any university you go to you'll see that they have a specialist within ottoman studies and they'll, they have, they'll have several classes on on ottoman studies yeah um and the other the other topic i mean for me for me like uh, during my time at university you had ottoman studies you had contemporary muslim thought and obviously, they needed to study that as well because they were going in invading many of these Muslim countries. Yeah. And then you have the South Asian specialists as well, which they yeah. did um, yeah. colonize. So it's, it's yeah. interesting to see that these are inventions of the West. Yeah. And there's a reason why they've invented these studies and why they continue to give out scholarships and grants and continue to teach yeah. these subjects. I mean, now, uh, may, many of my colleagues who are Ottoman historians might counter what I'm saying and say, you know, that's not what Ottoman studies departments are doing anymore. But there is an underlying deep um, sort of like, um, well, how can I say, sort of like, um, it's, it's been ingrained in some ways in regards to certain um, positions held in Ottoman studies that are never questioned. One of the things that Ottoman historians very rarely question is the position of Islam regarding Ottoman history. And how do we, it, I give you an example, in Islamic studies at the moment, in the field of Islamic studies, the field of sociology, the field of sociology of religion, the field of anthropology, um, the decoloniality or decolonial studies as, as a rising um, sort of like subject area, all of these um, areas are challenging how to conceptualize Islam, that within their own fields, they're having a problem in the way that you can conceptualize Islam, because the frameworks that they belong to doesn't allow them to do that to a certain degree vis-a-vis -vis how they see Islam, right? Ottoman studies doesn't want to touch Islam. It's like, we know what Islam yeah. is and we're just going to let yeah. it be. Um, but if the way that Islam is being conceptualized in these other fields is changing, surely this should have an impact in the way that we conceptualize the Ottomans as Muslims, the ulama as vanguards of Islam and Islam in itself and re-look at how Islam has been understood in the past and say maybe maybe Ottoman studies needs to re-look at the way that it's understanding the Islamic past vis-a-vis -vis Ottoman studies in that context and that hasn't happened as much yet and so you can still see that there are gatekeepers that have a particular uncomfortability regarding Islam and the Ottoman state. And when we learn Ottoman history, one of the things that I have no hesitation saying is Ottoman studies is still something which is within the framework of a liberal umbrella in that context. And if you try to posit or try to position Islam's importance um, more than it is stated within the field, then it can create forms of agitation. And now more and more people um, are studying Ottoman studies, but devoid of anything which is islamically related to ottoman studies mm -hmm. you know non-muslims in the ottoman empire and you know um which is fine i mean that that is important i i guess but what is an indication is nobody wants to touch the big question anymore which is islam and the ottomans in that sense mm -hmm. but i mean you can't study the ottomans without studying islam right because you I have think to so. that yeah i i think it, for you and i that that sounds like a given it's just standard of course and for mm -hmm. most Muslims, when we speak to Muslims, of course, for them, when when they they take an interest in Ottoman studies, for Muslims, their interest is in Islam. It's like, okay, you know, six hundred years of Islam, like what's going on? Like we, we exactly have been disconnected from this. We want to know. Um, but that's not how Ottoman studies is taught in the Western context. Um, it, 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 Islam is, to some degree, it's there. It's always there, but it's not there if you get what i'm saying you know mm -hmm. um and and that's quite interesting because 
um, when I speak to Muslims who take Ottoman studies, they don't know how to, to make sense of the Ottomans because they are taught that the early Ottomans are probably or maybe not Muslims. And then the later Ottomans were like, you know, um, not good practitioners of Islam at all. And then there was a particular decline period in the Ottoman period. And then they were secularizing. And then what you learn is for 600 years, where's the Islam? You know, there is no Islam in that context. What we need to do is layer in the factors, as you said before, about the complexities of a dynasty that's surviving for 600 years. And how can Islam not be there if we are still Muslims and we're still here today? We're still here today in the region, shall I say, is because the Ottomans, to some degree, maintain Islam's presence in the region for that long. Mm -hmm. for, you know, so that is something we need to um, scrutinize more. And it needs more Muslims with a Muslim mindset, you know, to, to be able to go into mm -hmm. the field and say, hang on a minute, you know, I, I want to ask different questions. And these sort of questions don't interest me. And the type of questions I'm asking, and without being slapped down, you know, trying to problematize some of the, the, the held positions. And it's okay if they, in the end, come to the conclusion that in this moment, the Ottomans were doing something which is not in accordance to Islam. Fine, we, that's okay. But so long as they have their inquisitive mind, I think that's important. Recently, the university, I was teaching a course a set of workshops to help Muslims understand and about the importance of learning history. And the first class was why we learn history. The second class was problematizing the learning of history within Western academia. The third class was um, can the Quran be instructive in the way that we as Muslims learn history as a whole? And the last class was the 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 the, the critiques of Ibn Khaldun regarding the learning of history. Because what's interesting is when people read Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddama, they don't realize that the first chapter is on why should we learn history? Yeah, everyone talks about the the As Asabia rise and fall, decline and so forth. They don't realize the first chapter is he's actually critiquing the ulama for saying, you know, we need to write history differently. That we need to be more, uh, we need to write history on a deeper level, not on a um, what he calls a surface level writing of history. That we should be having the expertise to to look at um, material, and we should not be writing history in the form of reports but it should be instructive. And then we should be able to, to just the way that Allah Ta'ala does in the Quran, help the reader understand why this is relevant to them in their capacity as Muslims. This is a fantastic um, sort of like ex explanation that he gives and people bypass that, um, you know, and he's, he makes the argument, which is interesting, which is that history should be part of falsafa, you know, and it should be a mainstay. In Western academia, what's interesting is there is a move by by some people right now to push history in the direction of science so you know when you have the the, the book homo sapiens for example yeah yeah yeah, homo, yeah where's the archival material for half of that book it's it's absent but the way that we introduce science as a way of it being history now mm -hmm. um, as a way of of trying to show the evolution of humanity and people buy into it and yet it doesn't go through any of the vigorous sort of like um, mm -hmm. um, examinations that we historians do in terms of looking at archival material because you can't have archival material for that early period of human history and so in that sense the possibilities of assumptions narratives and constructions are a lot easier to do but people will believe it and you, you know it, it's interesting you mentioned that that you know some some historians some people are starting to consider history um, as a form of science, like away yeah. from the social sciences. Yeah. Um, but there was something, I was just going back to one of the earlier things you said um, about the importance of, you know, the West creating th things like Ottoman studies, creating things like South Asian studies. Um, after 9-11, there was once a BBC interview with uh, Sheikh Hamza Youssef, yeah. and <clears throat> he was being interrogated about Muslims and the Muslim civilization. And one of the fascinating things he said to the reporter is that Arnold Toynbee is read um, and he's been discussed by the, the biggest Western academics. And he said the people in government read them. Mm -hmm. And he quoted one of the sayings of Toynbee on, when Toynbee was discussing his essay on Islam, where he mm -hmm. said, quote, woe unto the Western civilization if they were to wake up the Muslim civilization just as they did in the past. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's a clear indication of you know just the British mentality of divide and conquer. Yeah. Of them, you know, reading, uh, 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 of them understanding Islamic history, mm -hmm. seeing that the moment that Islam arrived until really the 18th century, the Muslims were the dominant power in world history. 
And now as I'm reading even Mughal history, I'm beginning to see that many of these uh, ideas that the Hindutva um, advocate for are really taken from the, the British. When the British came and wrote their colonial literature, blaming everything on the Muslims. And that's where you develop this narrative around people like Aurangzeb and how he was this tyrant. And so these ideas are still within our countries causing us these problems. And they continue to read our civilization. They continue to study us because they know what will happen if, you know, the Muslims unite. And this, again, goes back to this whole revivalist topic. Yeah, and, and this is the point. You know, what's interesting. It's not only um, did the British um, sort of create mythologies around Muslims in many ways, um, but then uh, what's intriguing is people like those who subscribe to Hindutva ideology um, fail to remember that it was the British who have created a reductionist in the understanding of Hindus in that context, right, when the British went to India. So, for example, um, Hinduism in of itself is a... Um, what you'd call a reduction of the various forms of deity worshiping that took place mm. within, you know, um, 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 you know the, the, the country of India in that context, right? Um, and this is even like, it sounds bizarre, but even the word curry, the word curry became a, a, a blanket slogan for, for food of the Asian subcontinent. And so people then will turn mm. around and say, I don't eat curry. And well, people say things even now today, they'll say, um, you know, um, do you eat Pakistani food? What does Pakistani food mean? I mean, yeah. food in Karachi is different from food in Islamabad, or food in Islamabad is different from Balochistan, and India is the same. So you can see these these labels that, that um, reductionist labels that have been created, and they have stuck because, to a particular degree, when the colonizing powers were colonizing the world, they simplified it in ways. And I've made the argument, and I continue to make the argument. For example, that calling Islam, for example. Uh, Abrahamic faith is problematic. The reason why I say that is because I'm currently working on a, an article explaining how the Ottomans had um, some sort of interaction with the Asiatic powers, because the Ottomans were a European imperial power, but the Ottomans were unique because they were also an Asiatic imperial power in, in, to some degree, right? And so um, when they were talking with the Japanese and the Chinese and, and so forth, um, one of the interesting things is they would say that the Ottomans or Islam was um, the tradition of law is what they said. Now, why is that? It's because Islam from its inception, from its inception, is dealing with um, polytheism or henotheism, the idea of having one deity and multiple um, deities. Yeah. And then it's dealing with um, Christianity and Judaism and Zoroastrianism at the same time. So Islam's interaction with quote unquote polytheistic practices is from the inception. So when Islam goes to China, to India, to Japan, and so forth, yeah, there is something that these civ civilizational peoples can resonate with regarding Islam. They don't see Islam as an Abrahamic faith. They don't mm. see Islam as part okay. of the Abrahamic family. They see Islam as something which is interacting with them which is something that they can resonate with. This is why conversions happen. This is why people become Muslim. This is why there's an interaction that takes place between these peoples and the way that they see the Ottomans. The idea of placing Islam as an Abrahamic faith was a specific Western European construction to place Islam within the frame of a Judeo-Christian tradition and then to place Islam under Judeo-Christian tradition by making Judeo-Christian narratives dominant over the Islamic narrative in that context. And this is problematic because the Quran specifically comes to address this point, that Islam came to address Judeo-Christianity. Islam did not come to be suppressed intellectually or be framed within this framework to become secondary to these traditions in that sense, right? And yet this is how Islam is now being placed within the Muslim mindset as well within the West by saying we are part of the Abrahamic faith. It is true that Ibrahim alayhi salam is the, the father of these faiths in that context. But it's also a, a, a reduction to some de degree because Islam is more than that. Unlike Christianity and Judaism, Islam, as I said to you before, came to address polytheism very quickly and different types of traditions like Zoroastrianism and so forth. And so it goes to India, it goes to China, it, it, it deals with Shintoism, it deals with Confucianism, it deals with... Um, various forms of deity worshiping in India and it finds ways of, of becoming part of their cultures to some degree and 
and amalgamating within that. And, and, and we see similarities. In that sense, this is why I think we have to ask a better question when we're saying, when we're looking at Islam as a civilizational discourse. And this is why I, don't, I think we need to find a way of, on the one hand, yes, agreeing with the similarities with our fellows in the, the Jewish and Christian faith, but at the same time, accepting the fact that Islam, Islam is exceptional. It is different. It is unique. And it's the last deen that Allah Ta'ala sends for a particular reason to be able to deal with all these different particular worldviews in that context. And that's how we should view Islam. So we need to find a new language. And a lot of our language is tainted by this 19th, 20th century um, phenomena um, to the point that I think sometimes it's not helpful. And, you know, Dr. Yaqub, I wholeheartedly agree with you about this topic of Abrahamic faiths. And in fact, both of us were in Malaysia together when mm -hmm. Professor Altas gave that lecture, <laughs> um, rebuking the idea of the idea, the idea of, of Abrahamic faiths, and that you know we agree that there is some sort of similarity um, that, that the Quran re refers to the Jews, refers to the Christians, um, that you know th that, that the prophets that they sent were indeed prophets, but that Islam is 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 a, is a universalist religion. It's open to everybody, um, and. It, it, it's something that we, we should remind ourselves. And it's interesting that the Ottomans, you know, as they were traveling and they were going to speak to these other countries, places like Japan, places like yeah. China, that they were engaging with them. And what I find quite fascinating is that when the Muslims first went to China, um, they, they struggled in that they they tried to present a form of Islam, which the people would accept. And ultimately yeah. they decided that the only way we could do this is if we indigenize Islam. Yeah. And so, they, when it came to referring to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because translating and using the ideograms were a bit difficult, they just mm -hmm. referred to him as the sage. Mm -hmm. And in, in the Chinese culture, they didn't call their people prophets. They called them yeah. sages, like yeah. Confucius. Yeah. And when they referred to Allah, they referred to the, they, they, they called Allah heaven. Yeah. Because in the Chinese tradition, they called Gavin, uh, God heaven, Tian. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so the yeah. idea of indigenizing religion is, you know, one of the reasons why Islam was so successful. And so I wholeheartedly agree about um, the point with with the Abrahamic religion. You know, uh, look, I would even make the argument in regards to the word religion in of itself. The word religion in of itself is a reduction because when we think of religion, instinctively we think of this idea of separation between church and state and something which is a reflection of something which is judo-christian in that context naturally that's how we see it not, it's not only islam but we will see confucianism in this way we will see, see shintoism in this way we will see taoism in this way we will see other um you know um um worldviews in this way that 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 that, that are constructed this way. And I don't think religion is helpful in that sense. And it's intriguing because what are the words that they're using in, I always say, in their own languages? I was only having a debate with my students the, um, a few weeks ago because when I was teaching in the theology department, I kept saying the word Allah. And one of my students said, why don't you say God? Why are you continuously saying Allah in that sense? And I said, but that's his name. And they said, yes, but you're teaching in English. Shouldn't you say God? And I said, I understand that there are some uh, thinkers that use the word God when they're speaking in English but I, I don't personally I make the caveat as soon as I'm about to start that I'm, I'm going to use the word Allah not God because Allah is, all, Allah is not the, the God of Muslims Allah is the universal term used in Arabic and for me Allah is not only his name but it's an invocation and I want to take the blessings from that invocation by saying his name and so if you guys don't mind, I'm going to use the word Allah, that means God. But now that I've given you this disclaimer, now we can move on from that. And I deliberately do that. And then say, look, I don't have a problem if you want to call him Bhagwan, Khudavan, Dharma, whatever you want to call him in the various religions. What's interesting is various traditions, sorry, shall I say, is that they all seem to have an idea of the one, you know? But exactly. All of these yeah. have it. They have the idea of the one. And I'm yeah. okay with that, you know, in that context. But I also want to sort of like familiarize people with the name of Allah. Because if you say, for example, in Arabic, La ilaha illallah, it sounds very strange to translate it as there is no God but God. God yeah. We know what we mean by this, is that his name is Allah. And for us, that has a particular meaning. For me, as a particular sense of decorum and respect, I feel very uncomfortable not saying Allah in that context. And so I remind my audience, I'll say, listen, so I'm going to be using the word Allah instead of the word God. 
because we've become accustomed to the God being the normative term as a neutral term to, to recognize the deity that's in the sky. But that's very, um, um, it's a sort of like anglophile uh, in position. But what I want to do is introduce what, it, what the word that I use, which is also a neutral term, which is used in the region. And I'm going to like make that the case to familiarize you guys with this. And you can do this with a particular set of practices and, and politeness and people will understand it. Um, the, the, I think I was speaking to a friend of mine, the Journal of Islamic Studies, I think it is. I could be wrong, and they might come after me, but I think it is the Journal of Islamic <laughs> Studies. They use the word God. They don't like, you know, we can't use the word Allah. We have to translate it to God, mm -hmm. which is quite bizarre because it's the Journal of Islamic Studies. Like, why can't we not use the word Allah in here? So you can see there are particular impositions in that sense. Um, even I've said this to you before, when we talk about the Quran, and if I were to write Allah says in the Quran, I would be reprimanded for saying yeah. that. I would have to say the Quran says. And that in itself is a particular form of intellectual, it's an intellectual imposition because what it does is it, it doesn't allow me or doesn't permit me to, to, to have a relationship with the Quran in the way that a Muslim should have a relationship with it. It creates a, a, a break in that sense by, by not permitting me to say Allah says in the Quran, which is habitual for me. And so as an academic, if you can imagine the, the types of reading I continuously do, it's, it's actually disconnecting me from the Quran to some degree because the language and the style and the structure of Western academia doesn't permit me to, to, in, to, to place my piety, my, inv my ability to invocate within it, which is a shame because I think academia should be pluralistic. It should have the capacity to embrace in the style that I write. And there should be no offense taken for me to write it in this way. And for the, the suggestion to, to, to say that it's not um, objective, I think it's not helpful here. Um, nobody's trying to turn anyone into a Muslim. I'm just um, indicating that I am a Muslim. I'm not afraid of that. And I would like to use a particular, particular decorum in the way that I write in regards to my faith about my faith in, in that context. And these are particular challenges we're still going through, I think. And to, what I'm trying to make with the whole thing in the convoluted way is how English is operating as a language, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And how, it's, how it intrinsically identifies Islam in a way that we don't even realize it can be quite deep rooted, that we, we ourselves then posit Islam within an understanding which is very um, Western European. Um, and it becomes indigenous for us without us recognizing that in other parts of the world, not Muslim world, other parts of the world, Islam is understood in a very different way and is a lot more closer to the indigenous forms of practices than we recognize. And we are assuming that Islam's interaction, especially including the Ottomans, is just an interaction with Western Europe. It's not. It's an interaction with Africa and Asia in the, to that degree. And I think overall, it's just interesting to see how departments like Islamic studies and academia still have their own worldview. And ultimately, we still have to play within, you know, there, there are confines with, with, with which we need to play. We need to play by their rules. You mentioned last time that you can't even say, uh, at least in some journals, you know, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? After the Prophet yeah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, now you're mentioning that, you know, you can't even say Allah, it has to be God. So there are still some certain rules that we have to play by. Um, you go ahead. Is there something you wanted to say? No, no, I was just agreeing with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but on a closing note, Dr. Yakub, what advice would you give for Muslims who are interested in going into academia, into the field of history, sociology, into the social sciences? What are some things that they need to keep in mind? Um, because we, we have a good number of them who, who are who are interested in the subject and want to know because you've been through the system like you yeah, said yeah. last time and there, there are certain you know things you wish you would have done um mm -hmm. and stuff like that so anything you'd like to share you know firstly um i don't think um in some ways the field of academia is not any different than any other field what i mean by that is every field that we study now in the academic structure is um, heavily influenced by a secular Western tradition. So I give an example. I, I um, went to have hijama done, you know, cupping. And um, the, the guy who did the hijama for me, may Allah ta'ala be pleased with him, he was a Syrian and he didn't have much money. And you know the hadith of Rasulullah, which is you must pay the person who does the hijama. So I went to pay him and he would refuse to take the money. And what was interesting at the, uh, on the day that is, um, 
is that he took a day off work and it's, it wasn't easy for him to take a day off work here in Turkey. And I remember I sat down to the hijab and had three young kids and so forth. And I just felt more and more um, guilty in, in this context. Anyway, when he went, when I went to do the hijab, he said, before I start, the both of us, are we going to recite Ayat al-Kursi and then we're going to recite the Fatiha. So I said, okay, fine. And I did it. And then my curiosity peaked. So I asked him, I said, can I ask you a question? I, I know the answer, but I want to hear it from you. Why did you make me recite these two verses? And why did you recite these two surahs or ayats and surah? And he says, because I'm inflicting a cut upon your body and I need to take the permission of Allah before I can do so. And your body is sacred, your soul is sacred. And this is an interaction between the two of us. And I need to turn to the Lord of the heavens and earth before I do this. Wow. And I smiled. The reason why I'm saying that is because a few weeks earlier, I had a friend also from the same part of the world. He's a surgeon. And I asked him, I said, you know, when you do operations, do you turn to Allah before you do any operation? He goes, no, man, I just cut parts out. And so I realized that, look, in the field of medicine, he's a medical doctor, but he's forgotten the, the, the fundamental practice as a medical doctor, which is to turn to Allah before you're doing anything to someone else's body. Hmm. And this is because in the field of medicine, of course, Islam is not a component there. It would have been a component in the past. In the past, the people who would have uh, uh, practiced medicine would have done, you know, would have recited the Bismillah, would have recited particular verses, would have um, taken care within the Islamic practices. When someone did, a Muslim doctor did your operation, they probably, you know, you know, Muhammad Salah does a sujood before he scores a goal. These Muslims would have done sujood after your operation or whatnot. They would have been a particular sort of mannerism. This is all missing. So it's not just the humanities in that sense, or social sciences. You can see in all the fields that you're studying, the component of Islam is missing. And Islam is important to be present in all of these areas when you are studying. Um, but the humanities in particular is unique because in the humanities, there is a particular um, culture of speaking of Islam. And in that sense, this is where the interesting part is. It speaks of Islam. It doesn't teach you Islam. Okay. Um, even in the theology departments around the world, you may learn particular practices of ilm, but you're not going to learn deen. So here is the issue, is there's, there's a particular disconnect regarding, not only in terms of the epistemology and the way it's taught within these um, academic environments, but even the pedagogy is incorrect. So for example, my students who are all Muslims, they can see I fundamentally care. I tell them off sometimes. I say, what are you doing? You're Muslim. You should be better to fear Allah and so <laughs> forth, right? Because I, I care for them. Oh, why do you, you know, you're not praying enough. You're doing tahajjud, you know, like we create these emotional connections because yeah. part of the pedagogy, part of the, the style of teaching in Islam is master disciple, is the, the idea that the teacher and Rasul Sallam is a teacher oh, in that sense. And he's teaching people and he's investing in people, which means you live side by side with them. You live with them. They they see you they see you embody Islam. And even if you make mistakes, they will forgive you for that because they're around you all the time. And so that is missing within the Western academic model, firstly, which is this relationship of which Islam is not only taught via books. Islam is taught via interaction. This is the, uh -huh. the, the, the first thing. So you're not going to find that in Western academia. So make sure that you have people around you that are going to give you that regarding Islam. The other thing that you're, you're not going to get in Western academia to some degree is that um, you can read the books, but you still need to be in the environments where the, there is an implementation of these ideas. There's a visibility of this. And that is often missing for Muslim students. And that is frustrating for them. So... Um, what I can say, however, is Western academia gives them fantastic tools of scrutiny, you know, but they still have to be able to scrutinize from their perspective. I'll give you a very simple um, experience. I was teaching students Sira, and we were teaching about Isra and Miraj. And we were saying one of the interesting things about the Isra and Miraj, why it's unique, is because when Rasul Sallam comes from meeting mm -hmm. Allah Ta'ala, he tells the Muslims that I've just gone and met Allah, and I have to tell everyone that I've met Allah. Now, the uniqueness about this journey is that <laughs> the Quraysh are interesting because they critique him, not on the, you know, the meeting Allah Ta'ala part, although they do, but they fundamentally squeeze him on the part of, you went to Aqsa? So it was something uh -huh. very ordinary then, because they were using their senses. They, they can't prove what Rasulullah saw on the heavens, but they could sort of 
make sense of what happened in this dunya. They say, really? You went on a horse with wings and so forth, you know, like trying to squeeze him here. And certain Muslims were warning us, so don't tell them, don't tell them. And the interesting thing about the Isra Miraj is this is a miracle that only Rasul Salam experienced. He didn't have to tell Muslims. He could have just mm. come back and said, now you have to pray five times a day, right? Because Allah said so. But he felt the need to tell them of this experience, which was a example of testing their faith, testing their, um, their, their trust in Rasul Salam and, mm. and, and so forth. But what was intriguing about this is this is not only... This is the aqidah issue. Why? Because first, Allah Ta'ala is capable of doing this. this and this is where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. If you are Richard Dawkins, of course, in your framework of rationality, you would say it's impossible for a man to sit on a horse with wings. It's impossible. I haven't seen a horse with wings. I don't know anyone who's seen a horse with wings. We don't have any archaeological evidence of a horse with wings. This is not possible. So from his rational perspective, to some degree, you would have to argue he's correct in making that um, that assumption. But what about Muslims? We first we predicate that with the with the the idea or the notion that there is a creator, and that the creator creates the heavens and the earth and created the inside and created everything in it. And so, as a result of that, if there is a creator who created everything that's in this universe. If he's capable of doing everything that's in this universe, why is he not capable of creating a horse with wings? Exactly. Why is that beyond your imagination? Yeah. These are both rational, but they're predicated by different things. Do you understand? Yeah. Now, the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that the, the Isra and Miraj is Aqidah because Allah is capable. The Isra and Miraj is Aqidah mm -hmm. because Allah speaks the truth. The Isra and Miraj is Aqidah because Rasul Salam speaks the truth. These are all predicated first by a particular worldview that you belong to. The point I'm making is that your rationality can be influenced by your worldview and the way you exercise rationality. And there's a false assumption that, that rationality can be universal, when in reality it's not. It's actually being influenced by something external. And in that case, the point I'm making here is one form of rationality is Western academia. Another form of rationality is the Islamic. And this is mm -hmm. where the key is, and the, the, the concern I have for Muslims who go into forms of Western academia is that there is a whole aspect that's missing when they are asking this question because they are not taught that question because Allah is not permitted to be a, a participant in the teaching of Islam in Western academia. Rasul Salam is not seen as an agent but just a historical figure in that context. Mm -hmm. And so when you yeah. take these components out, then how can you understand Islam correctly? So then you have to find a way of, of um, trying to get an alternative um, learning of this. And this is where now my argument is here. We need more and more Muslims like yourself and those who are listening to your podcast and so forth to have this particular level of taqwa, to have the iman tight, go into Western modes of learning, but recognize that this is not where they're going to take their Islam from. Um, mm -hmm. where they can learn how to write in a particular way regarding Islam um, and they can attain a particular particular tools, but then how can they use that to help them, the, the, the Ummah in the Muslim community? And not to lose, you know, their foundations shouldn't be sh shaken by the shoddiness and the weakness of Western academia. It's not a fair fight in that sense, but in, in the way that it, it presents the, um, um, the narrative of how Muslims can interact with Islam. It doesn't allow Muslims to interact with Islam. It allows Muslims to interact with particular forms of information about Islam. And so if they have a weak understanding of Islam, it's because they were never in an environment where they were given the freedom to learn Islam in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so there has to be there has to be alternative institutions, maybe, or there has to be these people within Western academia who are Muslims who can protect and safeguard other Muslims by giving them that. Or Muslims need to find alternative modes of learning outside of the Western academic model that will supplement their Islam so that they can understand it. Because Islam is deen, which means it's not just a subject we learn. It's your way of life. You have to be, it has to give you meaning. And so they need to find people and institutions where they can do that. And, and I think ultimately they need to have a strong foundation of deen before they even get into academia. Um, yeah, and I think we need to do that, you know. So people like so people like myself, people like yourself, when we meet people who are younger, 
we need to um, try to, you know, when I was young, I was sent to school so that school can fix me. It was the idea was like the agency was taken out of the household and placed within the schooling structure, hoping that they would make turn me into a good, good boy, a good national, good citizen in that sense. And then I was sent to madrasa, and the hope was that they would do the same. But really, at home, we need to find ways of um, instilling in our children and then in our milieu, um, kids that we interact with all the time, young people that we interact with all the time, to give them very good, strong foundations, um, so that they can be better equipped with Islam. So as they get older, that the Islam is still within them. And it has to be intellectual and emotional. It cannot be one or the other. This emphasis on inter intellectualism over the emotional is problematic. You have to also emotionally feel, spiritually feel attached to your Lord in that context. You cannot um, dis detach that. So uh, as a young kid growing up, I was fortunate that many of my family members, my parents, and my friends and colleagues emotionally made me feel part of Islam and I was I had a pride in that and so when someone challenged it I didn't just abandon Islam straight away there was a okay hang on a minute you know at least I was willing to give Islam a chance and see if it stood up to the scrutiny that Western academia mm -hmm. put forward and on many terms it didn't and Dr. Yaqub just on a closing note um mm -hmm. last week we had Dr. Shuaib Ahmed Malik um mm -hmm. speak um on a similar topic and he said that you know, it seems very appealing to go down a route like as a historian, as a social scientist. You know, you're you're reading books for fun. Why not turn it into a career? But even within that, there's a lot of difficulties. There's a lot of hardships. There's a number of years of studying. There's a lot of uncertainty as to where you're going yeah. to work. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on this matter? What would you say to somebody who has, you know, someone like myself who, who wants to embark on a path like this, but understands there's a lot of uncertainty and difficulty on it? So I'm going to say something which is going to sound really ri ridiculous and bombastic, but when a Muslim is in the pursuit of ilm and deen, then they are pursuing something for the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala. So they want to get closer to Allah Ta'ala, and they want to be loved by Allah Ta'ala. And in order to be loved by Allah Ta'ala, then Allah Ta'ala in response is going to test you, and is going to shape you, and is going to put you through situations in which um, you can be um, a, a correct representative of that ilm that you are learning to be promoted. And as a result, I have yet to meet a, and read about a proper student of knowledge who hasn't gone through hardship. Because the objective of, of going through hardship and the way that Allah Ta'ala puts you through these particular challenges is to shape your character. And we can see this with the case of the uh, Anbiya, and we can see this with the case of Rasul Sallam. So Allah Ta'ala was developing them, shaping them. And these were people who were um, practitioners of ilm in that context. So any student who sincerely wants to get close to Allah and wants to study any form of ilm for the pleasure of Allah Ta'ala, to please Allah then, you have to accept that then uh, for Allah's love to be shown in your direction, that Allah is also going to try to cleanse you in a particular way in which you're going to go through particular intellectual, emotional, and spiritual challenges to strengthen you so that whatever you produce for the sake of Allah is of pristine quality. In that sense, the only advice I give any student then is it is naturally going to get tough. It's naturally going to be hard. Look what you're up against. So look at what you're trying to achieve. What you're trying to achieve is you're trying to dispel mythologies and, and narratives and lies and falsehoods about Islam. As a result of that, do we think that the that those who are the carriers of falsehood in any shape or form are going to allow us to be free in the way that we can write about Islam. No, of course not. And then there are those in the community that takes, um, you know, who have been tainted by various ideas, by various people that we want to dispel from amongst their midst. And that's tough. But what you learn from Rasul Sallam is he had the haq, he spoke the haq, he was the messenger, he had the Quran, and still people were not believing him. This is the case of Abu Sufyan, you know, when you see the issue of Abu mm -hmm. Sufyan in particular, when Rasul Sallam asked him, and his skepticism towards Islam. His issue wasn't so much about the idea of rejecting Allah Ta'ala. He, his pride couldn't handle the fact that Rasul Sallam was a messenger of Allah. It, 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 it irked him in that sense, you know. He, and he was trying to find ways of how can how really disguise a prop. And he wanted, to, because he saw himself as a particular person within Meccan society, that he couldn't tolerate it. But deep down, the chances are is that Abu Sufyan knew very early on that Islam is the truth and that Allah exists and Rasulullah is the messenger of Allah. He couldn't come to terms with that. And so there are many occasions where there are going to be people 
who are not going to come, are not going to be willing to come to terms with what you have to say, and it doesn't make sense why they're not coming to terms uh -huh. with what you have to say. And then you 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 realize this is where tawakkul comes in, this is where trust in Allah Taala comes in, and this is where the importance is. It's not important what they think; it's important what Allah thinks. This is the key, right? And this is the hard work. And so every proper student of knowledge. What I say is you're going to go through challenges, but then the other students of knowledge must support you. And they, they mm. must understand that as a collective of students of knowledge, this is the hardship. You're going to be tested maybe with your finances. You might be tested with your, um, your knowledge. You might be tested with your health. You might be tested with your family. You might be tested with um, traveling. You might be tested with your resources. All of these things are possibility. You might be tested by meeting particular Muslim teachers who you admired and then found out that they're not so great as people. But none mm -hmm. of these things should shake your faith in, in Islam or the, the studying of the knowledge. And it shouldn't deter you from attaining the knowledge still. You should still keep going because you're doing this for Allah. So all of these things are possible. And I'm telling Muslims, to keep their head up, keep going, because this, this deen of us is 1400 years of a very robust tradition and it's still here. And that's phenomenal. And we want to be a part of that process rather than falling off the wagon, you know, and, and letting someone else do it. And um, this is a human endeavor. So um, it's going to be hard. But alhamdulillah, Allah Ta'ala will reward those who put in the effort, is my belief. Hmm. And exactly. Every student of knowledge, every scholar you looked at went through a sort of tribulation. And yeah. on the, the podcast we did last time, you mentioned that Imam Al-Ghazali said that Allah will never put obstacles yeah. on the path of the person who's going to pursue knowledge hardships right. will come but yeah. obstacles um yeah. allah, allah will facilitate ease yeah. so yeah. i think that's a beautiful reminder to end this podcast with jazakumallah khairan dr yakub no for always sharing your insights with us um, you, if anybody is interested dr yakub has a number of articles online especially his one on yaqeen institute on the muslim amnesia um, which i would highly recommend um and so with that we will conclude Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.